This morning's presentation. This is Asterisk from Scratch. It is intended to be a higher level overview of the Asterisk project. We make no assumptions that you know what Asterisk is even, but that perhaps that someone dragged you along to this conference because they just didn't want to be lonely. That can happen too. All right. And it is Las Vegas. All right. So Asterisk on 2014 is where we are learning Asterisk from Scratch. Continuing on from this morning, if you were not here and you would like a copy of these slides, you can contact me by any of these methods or you can leave me your business card at the podium. I am Melissa Shepard, not Justin Hester. Justin will be here to do this afternoon session where we go deeper into the schedule. In fact, the schedule as it looks now, you have covered this morning an introduction to the asterisk project, what it is, Digium and also learned a little bit about asterisk architecture, the modularity of it, what it can and can't do, configuration files, some things of interest. I've learned a little bit about some of you who stayed, and if I haven't seen you, I may call you um, for a pop quiz if you're just appearing, and then everyone in the, who was here this morning can go because they know the answer. I'm not gonna do that. We will be going over installing asterisk an intro to dial plan before lunch. And lunch is at the pool today, if you have not heard. It is at the pool. What about, what about installing asterisk? Some of you guys may have had, and girls, may have had a little bit easier time than others installing asterisk because you may have installed it from a distribution. How many of you just put a CD into a drive or downloaded it to a thumb drive and installed it. You ever done that? Just like distribution, right? And what distribution did you use? Uh, free, PBX. free PBX, good, okay. That is one way to install it and we'll cover that last of all. The other common ways that you can get asterisk onto your system, and as we learned this morning, um, asterisk only runs on what platforms? Linux. Linux, none of that Windows stuff. I mean SigWin, but who cares about that, right? Okay. It's not really Windows, right? And typically, many people start out by yum installing it. Let's say if you're on a Debian variant, I mean, not, not sorry, a Red Hat from the Asterisk repository, or from the Ubuntu. If you're on Ubuntu, you might apt get Asterisk, right? That's not the way that I would do it because once you learn to do it from source, you have more flexibility with that. You can. Take out what you don't want, put in what you do want. So source is flexible. Perhaps it's the most difficult until you learn all the steps. Repositories are easy with your package manager, typically whatever I said, whatever you're running, or a graphical distribution. Now here's a question that always would come up. Choosing a version. How do you choose what version of asterisk that you are going to install? Anybody good? Your boss told you to, right? It's like he told you which version of Linux you were going to use, and then your boss said you're going to install this version, but why? Or why would you tell your boss which one you wanted to do? That's, that is correct. That is, what else? That is true. If your boss is OCD about that sort of thing, right? If he's, if he's a manager who's responsible for, for millions of dollars, then he might be a little bit of OCD about that. If he didn't have you on his staff, because he knew he was going to call you at 24 hours of the day to be able to support asterisk, that's what, right? Long-term support, because long-term support releases are eligible for Digium support for one thing, okay? What's the difference between the two, really, though? Long-term support releases are released every other year. So are standard releases. What they do have, though, is that they are fully supported for four years. And that's where that OCD bit comes in. Fully supported for four years means you can call up for support and help. Okay. Now, one year of additional security fixes. By contrast, your standard releases, which are also released every other year, only have one year of full support and one year of maintenance for security fixes, right? And bug fixes, how often do they roll around? About every four weeks, maybe monthly, you'll see some bug fixes rolled into that, that you have to. All right, now this handy chart, and I found this at wiki.asterisk.org. 
Do you all use wiki.asterisk.org? If you have not gone to this site, you need to go. Because this is where developers put the most current information about how to configure Asterisk and its components. And in fact, if you do not know how to, say, configure the PJSEP channel driver, I would go to this source before any others. Don't go Googling. Don't use that VoIP info anymore. Go to wiki.asterisk.org. It's straight from the horse's mouth. And do not say I called developers horses. They are not. Okay. So looking at this currently, the current asterisk long-term long support release is 11. 1.8 was out. Okay. It is now no longer long-term support. And you can see that um, coming up, we anticipate 13 is in beta currently, but 13 will be the next long-term support release, and it will have PJ Project and PJ SIP, new channel driver. It will have enhanced features for WebRTC and ARI. You will like it, I hope. If you've used 12, you already got a little preview of what was coming in 13, because that is the value of the standard release. The standard release is where they throw all of the fun stuff. All of the stuff that's not really proven so that everybody in the community can kick the tires and say, hey, this doesn't work, hey, this doesn't work, so that the next year you can arrive at something they can support for four years. Okay. How can we get this stuff? Installing from source. Do you know what I mean by, by source? Okay, Because source is the actual code itself. And when you get the code, they will have scripts that will help you compile it on your machine. Okay. It is not a one-shot, I've got the whole thing, I just hit install, it goes. Okay. There are certain steps you have to take in this. And usually get it in two forms. You can go to the wiki um, site, well, not the wiki, the asterisk site, or the Digium site, and you'll be pointed to it. Let me see if my wireless works. It was not working earlier. Oh, look at me. I bet I can't get there. We're going to have to do this blind. Yes, that's what I was afraid of. Oh, it works. This did not work earlier. It's very good. Okay, so if you wanted to get source, I would appreciate it if you would go through this way so that we can capture information about who's using asterisk. But there's, there's another way you could go for this. You could just go to downloads.asterisk.org. Okay. You can download the current source for asterisk here. Or you can go for the asterisk now. How many of you have used asterisk now? It's got a GUI based on free PBX, right? And in fact, Schmooze is now supporting that project as well. And we'll talk about that a little bit at the end of this module. Okay. So you would download this to your Linux machine. You could just go in and wget it if you're using Red Hat Linux to the directory that you want. Typically, I'll put that in USR SRC. The other way to do that would be subversion. Okay. And I'm just noticing that I need to flip back here so we can show you that too. Where is that repository located? Sorry, guys. I'm having an interesting time with this. I was blaming it on the technology earlier, but it's really got to be me. And in fact, if you visit the website for subversion repository, and I know that everybody in the room right now is asking, why is this not git instead of subver subversion? Because that particular repository software, git is what we use for, um... okay, maybe we don't get to see this after all. Right. So if I go to svn.asterisk.org, svn, this is the place where you're going to be able to, without downloading the source, just get a little preview. If you actually wanted to see the code, for instance, in each module, you could drill down into, let's say, the branch that I want is 11. Let's say that I'm a little bit OCD, too, which I am, and I want the current long-term support release, patches and all, okay? Then I could go in here and have a look at some of the code before I got it in source. For instance, Chan Sip. Okay. 
And those of you who were here this morning know that ChanSIP is a channel driver. That means it enables the technology SIP to create and manage channels into and out of asterisk. And lots of good information from looking at this, including dependencies are often noted in these files. Does anybody know about dependencies? Yeah, dependencies. Um, some people are going to say dependencies, they make my life miserable. All right. Because every time you try to install something, if you don't have a package manager that meets the dependencies, or if the repository that you're using of software out there does not have the dependency that matches, what do you have to do? You have to go and find a piece of software that works, install that, and then you can compile from source. That's a big problem, and it's some, one reason why people often go with distros instead of going with just plain vanilla asterisk and building from source, because you have to meet those crazy dependencies first. So SVN, and you can, you can get it from that site by installing SVN and checking out that source to a directory and then just updating it as you need to, and that way you don't have to keep doing the tarballs. And for those of you who are not familiar with Linux, I'm, using, I'm throwing around the word tarball as though you knew what it is, just in case there's anyone who does not. It is the equivalent of a, say, a Windows zipped file. It's simply a compressed version of all of that source. So you'll download that, and you will go, and you will extract it to the directory that you want. Now, craziness, as I said, about dependencies. I'm going to give you a little bit of advice to make this easier. So you're mad about asterisk. You're crazy about asterisk. You really like the distro, but you want to try from source. Before you even begin to install asterisk, my recommendation is that you have these two repository definitions if you're using Red Hat, and this is extra packages for Enterprise Linux and RPM Forge, because when we go out to resolve those dependencies, some of what you need may be in these repositories. So before we do anything else, you might go to your Linux machine, if it's Red Hat in this case, because I'm using a Red Hat Package Manager, and install the repository definitions that will allow my system to use yum and resolve dependencies automatically without, and find the packages that it needs, some of which asterisk needs. Another piece of advice that is not on this slide, if you are compiling asterisk before you do anything else, make sure that you update your kernel headers. Make sure also that you have the kernel develop package so that it can compile, All right, or else you will be frustrated with that. Going into it, using Zen, Saying, I've got what I need. These are the recommendations. Okay, I think I see somebody actually who is on the slide who is in this audience. Um, let's see if we get this. Um, so the steps. Get the repos you'll need to resolve your dependencies. Download your sources. If you have hardware cards, if they're digital cards, you'll want Dottie and libpri. Those are separate projects, but you can go to downloads.asterisk.org and grab those. And Digium, also downloads.digium.com for anything that's Digium, Dottie, for instance. Okay. If it's Digium, it's going to be downloads Digium. Asterisk, downloads asterisk. Okay. You will then unpack your sources, and then you will compile. And how do we do this? On these slides, which is why you're going to request them later, I do have those steps in order for what you need to do. And I almost feel like not switching over to Google Chrome ever again because it blanks out my screen. Well, that's life. Okay. So in this particular case, you decide if you're going to use, um, a, if you're going to download a tarball and extract it, just be consistent about where you put that tarball. If you come to our training class, we're going to just say use USRSRC. That's our convention. All right. But you guys know this because you know what pain it is to lose some things. And after you have downloaded this tarball, and you can see that I have some here, then you will issue the command to extract it. There is no untar extract. And if I want to see it on screen, maintain file structure. 
whatever the tarball is. And in this case, uh, how about asterisk? I've already extracted it, you can see. But if I wanted to extract it, then it's going to extract all the files and subdirectories. And as you can see up here on the screen, we're asterisk um, 11. I've already extracted that directory. Now, after you get there, Right. Before you install Asterisk, you have to meet your Linux dependencies. And you can either go onto a website, you can check on the wiki, you can check in the source and look for these dependencies, or you might use a little handy script that some people recommend that is maintained by the community as well. And I'm going to show you that. When you unpack your source, jump into that directory. It is usually found in the contrib, well, Let's go. Uh, contrib. Scripts directory. And this is a little script called install prereq, and we can see it here. When I first started working for Digium, I was having to search all over the place for how to fulfill, give, give people recommendations on how to fulfill dependencies. I mean, you might find it in um, asterisk, the definitive guide. How many people have that book, the fourth edition? Yeah? Like, um, hero worship here, are you going to go see those? Yeah, Russell Bryant and life, when they give a presentation, they're here, the authors are here, okay? You might find the dependencies there, but as we know, as asterisk changes and paper does not, that's not a real good way to find your dependencies, is it? Okay, the wiki is good too. You go to wiki.asterisk.org. Or this communi the community. And this particular bash script has taken what they know, and you'll notice down here Debian packages and Red Hat for what should meet your dependencies. I like the script. There are only a couple of things that are wrong with it. Sometimes it doesn't get the package quite right, but then it becomes very easy to tell. If I do install prereq here, it's going to tell me, look, you need to select. You can do test. That is handy. You can just get a list of dependencies that are not met by doing that. Install um, is what you would do to install those dependencies. So if I do install prereq test, I can get a really good idea of what my system needs to install. We can see the packages that it needs to install here in order to meet everything that is selected by default in core and extended. And we're going to talk about core and extended modules when I jump over to a tool in just a second called Make Menu Select. Make Menu Select is how you can select to compile or not certain modules that you may not need. You don't even need them on your system. Security says don't build them. And this would have been more extensive had I not already installed some things. Actually, I think that gmime2, some of these may run with errors. If you tried to run this and it says could not at the end after you've installed all the packages, it says there are extras, then you can dig a little bit deeper. Such as in asterisk 12, SQL Lite 3, that package is not really called SQL Lite 3. And you can on your system do an RPM, well, if you're CentOS, right? I'm going to do all CentOS and just forget about um, Ubuntu, which I use at home, or Debian. RPM QA, let's say, um, what's one that we always need? Gmime, right? And it says up there. Well, do I not have it truly? OK, I probably need to install that, don't I? All right. But telling what's on your system, it may be, a, it may be that you have what you need already <coughs> to build it. What I am showing you here is Okay, so I've got, for instance, this one. All right. So in this one, I've got a different version, SQL Lite 3, but it'll work with asterisk on this machine. Even though it said I, up here I needed to install the SQL Lite 2, I have SQL Lite installed, but it's a different on my version, which is CentOS 6.5. Point is, if you were searching for a way to quickly meet most every dependency for your asterisk build, because you're going to build from source, I am going to say, use that script and see what happens. It will also, if you have the correct repositories installed, get the correct version of PJ Project for Asterisk 12. If you do the same thing with the source tarball, 
for asterisk 12 and you're building it and you run that script, then you may not have to go to the wiki page on how to install projects separately. As far as I've tested, I've tested both ways, installing PJ project manually and installing it from the install prereq script, both work. Now this little tool right here, select what to compile from source. Make menu select. This is a tool that people often use for a visual check. People do like the graphical nature of it, so you can do this. That's not to say, if you're compiling from source, you can actually pass it arguments on the command line when you're making the um, compilation, right? You can, like, choose to leave in and leave out. Like if you totally wanted to leave out meet me or you wanted to add it, because 11 does not add it by default anymore then you can pass that on the command line. But if you were just getting started, order of operation, after you meet your Linux dependencies, and you tell asterisk that those dependencies are met, get all your dependencies met, you go into that source directory where you're gonna do your compilation. Here's a little command. Can everybody see that at the bottom? I'm going to blow that up. Okay. This is going to tell asterisk, and by virtue of that, make menu select about your dependencies that you've just installed. This is the first step that you're going to run. Okay. After dependencies. And every time you meet a dependency, guess what? You've got to run this over again. I'm sorry. That's the way it goes. So if I were to run that, and um, I can probably do that right now, then it's going to check for the modules that it needs for make menu select to select what to compile. Running it like this doesn't do anything to asterisk. It's not going to impact anything. It's just a check, unless I actually start to compile. But after configuring this, as it goes on and on and on, okay, right, relatively fast. Yay! Okay, if you don't see that asterisk, things are wrong, very wrong, okay. Looking at configure, then after doing that, I run make menu select. This is, relies on the end cur on end curses, right? Wherever you see applications that have an asterisk by it, those are going to be compiled after you run make menu select. And by default, everything that's in core will be selected for installation when you download it for source by default. Now, down below, extended. Does anybody right offhand know the difference between core and extended modules? Okay, it's good. What core is, is it has support of developers and the project with Digium itself, core. Extended means that it's a great thing, lots of people use it, but it has got communities, it's primarily community support it is not going to be something that Digium will put developers necessarily on or the bulk of the community. Don't consider it a priority. For instance, look, here's one app facts. Oh my gosh, what does that XXX mean? For this application facts. Yeah, it means one of my dependencies were not, was not met earlier on. And in fact, I can see right down here what that dependency was. And on in curses, my mouse doesn't work, but you can see depends on span DSP. People with really good eyes noted that when I ran the install prereq script, it complained and said I needed to install span DSP. All right. So span depends on that. If I install that, if I jump out of this now and install that, then I have to go back and run dot, the configure script again to tell make me select. But since I don't really need app facts in this case, I'm going to ignore it. Okay, you'll see application, bridging modules, uh, call detail recordings. Let's see if we can find eh, applications. Is that the one? And actually, in applications, please note if you use Meet Me, that Meet Me, they will say is deprecated, but when you get to it, it's not going to be selected. Okay? When a lot of people move from 1.8 to 11, okay, and they were testing it at first, they didn't notice that Meet Me. They just leave it off. It's an extended support, but they want to encourage you to use ConfBridge because it's simply a better um, application for some things. And it does not rely upon Dotty because Meet Me relies on Dotty for timing. Channel drivers, what can you compile and not? I don't have the dependencies met for Chan Motif hat yet here, so I would have to go and find um, these things I can't pronounce. 
except I can pronounce ResX in PP, all right, before I was able to use that. If I wanted resource modules, test module, if I wanted extra sounds, music, if I wanted a different format, may talk a little bit about codecs and formats, but if I wanted a different format for recording, maybe one that took a little bit more bandwidth, G729 is, is proprietary. Maybe I have, maybe I wanted something that had a little bit more bandwidth than the GSM, something that sounded better. Then I could record, I could compile all of Allison's sound files, all of Allison Smith's wonderful voice sound files in a higher quality format. And this is where I would select to do that, as a matter of fact. If I wanted them, yeah, I don't know, yeah, we're in the United States. If I wanted that, then I would select that. And when I compiled, it would put it where I needed it to be. Okay, and you would then save and exit. And at this point, you'd be free to run make, and then make install. And asterisk would be up and running, but nothing would be happening. So you would run make samples. Remember I talked about these sample configuration files. Modules won't load without a configuration file. So you at least need to do write your own or run make samples. And then one final one, which is make config, which actually causes asterisk to run as a service, okay? It will write the init script so that you can, so every time, ask, every time your system restarts, asterisk will be up and running too. Generally, that is how it's done, generally. Okay, and as I said just now, um, configure, meets your, make sure that asterisk knows that your Linux dependencies are met, the other extra packages you need. Make menu select to select what you want. If you don't know how to configure that on the command line, turn to wiki.asterisk.org because they will show you how to do that there too. Make and make install. And in this case, I just put it on two lines because I hate stopping in the middle. That just, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the ampersand ampersand, that's simply, if the first part completes, do the second part on the command Linux command line. If it doesn't complete, stop. Okay. So generally, I could string all of these together with the ampersand ampersand and leave the building, or I could do a script. All right. So from subversion, we won't cover that, but it's the same way of getting your source. You just select a directory, and um, I'm not going to go into that in depth because I really firmly believe they're going to change to get really soon, but it's simply you're going to go and check out that source and install it directly from the source, and you can perform all the tasks you saw up there. Okay. But from your repository, okay. There's not just one particular package. You can't just do yum install asterisk and hope it will work. You also may have to do yum install asterisk config for supplemental things. And you may need, actually, if you're with CentOS, to install some more repositories. Okay. Packages.asterisk.org. If you want to be able to yum from, from asterisk, from the project itself, then you could jump into your yum repos definitions directory and simply pull down the repos definitions, those little files that tell your package manager where to search out there for packages. Because asterisk and digium both have those constructed already for you. Otherwise, you could take, make a best stab guess at it and, and write your own, but just go and get them from here. Put them in your, um, and they'll automatically be searched when you do this if you're wanting to yum asterisk from asterisk. Okay. And also would recommend the Digium repos as well. Right. And how would you do that? After you got those repos done and you wanted to say, yeah, I can use the package manager to do this and just get whatever's out there, whether it's exactly what I want or not, how would, it, how would I do this? You would issue a yum install asterisk, asterisk configs, and this last line, enable repo equals asterisk 11. That's how you choose the version number. So you can put the definitions for 12 and 11 in there, but then you specify which one you want to compile on that machine by grabbing it there. Okay. And dependencies are automatically resolved, which is why people use modern package management anyway, isn't it? Okay. However, you can see in red, it's less flexible and not always the latest version. The latest version is probably going to be if you get it through subversion, right? Because you're connecting to the library that's being, being uh, well, does anybody actually, has anybody actually used a package management tool?
tool and installed Asterisk? Raise your hand if you've done that. Yum or apt get. Okay. Problems you encountered or no problem? Okay. All right. So something usually breaks then, or that one particular thing? You, you use your monitoring software? Okay. For that. Right. Okay. Now, the, there's nothing to stop you from building your own repository, right? If you want to invest in that. It's, the tools are free for anybody. If you have, for instance, if you're working for a closed government installation and you wanted to have, and you're running all Red Hat machines and you wanted to have your own repository with these packages, you're welcome to build that yourself and keep it up to date. But out there in the wild, when you were, this may not be the very latest version you get. So that's one thing, but you can get it this way. All right. And right here, as I've said, this is a link that if you request the slides, you may wish to follow the wiki uh, asterisk packages which will um, give you more information about the repositories and how to install from using your package manager. Okay, distributions. Some of you already came in and said, yes, I am using the uh, asterisk now, okay, which is based on a fork of CentOS. And it's actually a fork called Schmooze Linux. All right, believe it or not. Okay, but it behaves exactly with the latest versions of Asterisk now. It behaves just like CentOS. In essence, it is. Okay. But because of packaging restrictions with CentOS, that's how it's done now. And they actually, you can get this you know, from the free PBX site, or there is that link to it from the uh, asterisk.org site, so you can download this. And what are some of the benefits of this? Somebody tell me, why did you choose this way? Somebody who was using asterisk now, right now, tell me why did you choose this way to go about it? It was a lot easier. No kidding. It's so easy, in fact, that, I mean, you just had to download it. It's an ISO. You mount it for a virtual machine, for instance if you were interested in doing that, and you may have noticed that I am actually using virtual machines to power everything here, then you can simply attach it. And within minutes, it does all the work for you. Uh, did I do this one already? Okay, I did. Okay. I think I already installed it here. Well, but you can see. And when you're first presented with the screen, the installation screen, it'll ask you, um, in, the in the version I have here, it asks you, do you want asterisk 1.8, asterisk 11? It'll give you a choice of versions to install, and it'll install the GUI interface for you, and it's running. And not only that, it has certain um, security features enabled by default that you're going to have to figure out how to build if you do plain vanilla asterisk. And it also sets up, you know, both your root user and a separate admin user for you when you install that. Now, I like that because I like the granularity and I like auditability of things. I like to know what user or junior system its administrator has hosed my system. Okay. And that is another great feature of something that's running on free PBX, isn't it? Because you have that sort of, um, I guess, uh, audit ability built in with your admin users and the granularity to assign them ability to do certain things. Okay. It is all stuff that you would have to build in yourself. And here's what I was going to point out about this. As you can see at the top, SHMZ, I cannot make this any larger, apparently, um, release 6.5, final. Okay. And so if you went in and you uh, actually looked at the, at the Red Hat version or the release number, it would actually say Schmooze Linux. That's what that is based on now. And if I log in, um, let's see if I can do that. Still is root as I'm here. Okay then it's going to tell me a certain amount of useful information. And directory structure, too, in this distribution, you gotta know when you're using a GUI, it is asterisk, this, this is asterisk, but it's gonna have a different directory structure, and I'm sorry, this is very hard to read. I should just SSH in here instead. If I were to go into my uh, Etsy asterisk directory where all my configuration files are, then I'm going to see things that are not necessarily part of plain vanilla asterisk. There'll be things like, uh, sip underscore custom dot conf instead of just sip dot conf for my endpoints. And distros often do this. Why do distros do this? They do this so that they do not overwrite your changes. They allow you the flexibility of being able to have a GUI, 
but also for you to be able to use the CLI or configure things. And your changes must be put in your own special file that whoever the creator of that distro is, when they do an upgrade, they try not to overwrite your stuff, okay? Because that's painful. I'm looking at this pretty much. The screen that you saw before, if you were going to install to something like that, is um, different options that you may be pleased with. Oh, RAID or no RAID. Okay, and Advanced does allow you to, to make some decisions along the way. If you just do full install, just go, then it'll install the def defaults and what it thinks is right for your system. Okay. And it does install Dottie with that, by the way. Okay, so generally the three ways to install asterisk that you're going to get. Um, source, repository, or get a distro and learn how to do it from that. You can still get to the CLI and use many of these tips and tricks that you're going to learn today. Okay. So that is, we've come to the end of that portion of it. If y'all want to get up for five minutes and stretch and uh, move around, then that's fine. Or we could barrel right through. Um, does anybody have to get up and stretch? I believe in a little bit of movement. Today's speaker, um, most of you have been in here all day. Those of you who have not, I'm Melissa Shepard. You can have a copy of these slides later. You just leave me or later this afternoon, Justin, a copy of your business card or scribble it on a napkin. We'll accept that too. A little bit of intro to dial plan. Ha, I used this word this morning. And then I used it again, and then I said we'd get to it, and we're going to get to it. Dial plan. Raise your hand if you actually actively write dial plan in extensions.conf. Okay, good. Raise your hand if you maybe assign extensions through a GUI, a graphical user interface. Do you assign extensions through a graphical click? Good. Well, this is the magic mystery of what goes on underneath that. And first of all, in order to understand how we do it, you have to understand what dial plan is and what it is not. Dial plan, extensions. It's configured in extensions.conf, not dialplan.conf, although if you make changes to it and you're on the CLI and you want those changes to appear, you will have to hit dial, type dial plan reload. Isn't that just confusing? Dial plan is a scripting language. It is a set of commands that you direct calls through at its simplest. We're going to cover that. We're going to cover extensions.conf syntax, looking at that. And then we will just build or look at a couple of basic extensions. And if you come back this afternoon, Justin is going to do some more on that. Okay? All right. In a traditional PBX, simple table. If it's an extension, it's a phone. It is that phone, not even an endpoint. Because we throw words like endpoint around now because we don't always mean a phone, do we? Or if we, we say endpoint, we say it so it could mean a SIP hard phone or a soft phone, or it could mean a web browser as your endpoint. It could mean a soft client running on your cell phone. Could be any of those things an endpoint. Point is, you're not going to map anymore like a PBX an extension to that. If you look at these phones, for instance, what? I have two lines on this. It's no longer an extension. I have more on the D70. Okay? You probably have more lines. You can program multiple lines in soft clients as well. An extension is not necessarily a one-to-one -one mapping. Right? An extension is something written in asterisk scripting language that directs a call through the system in some way. Logic, set of instructions. We will see this. Now, why does, it, why does it look like I don't have what I need here to tell you about these things? Contexts. Where we begin is contexts. Every single bit of this logic that you put into your dial plan is going to exist in a bucket, a separated unit that is named. You will recognize a context because it has brackets and the context name. Sometimes I don't use a hyphen because that might be a cut character I want to use later, but it doesn't matter what you put in there. Okay? I would respect case sensitivity if you're going to do this yourself. 
Okay. It's a good idea in anything Linux to do that. It may not have been important in previous versions of asterisk. However, going forward, you should expect things to change. Okay. Now, two contexts. Let's look at these here. Context. These are extensions that are in here. I would be willing to bet that if you dialed 500 and you had access to that demo context, you would get some piece of logic happening on the system that you program in there. And if you had, or if you had access to the default context, if you dialed 500, then some bit of logic would follow. Problems only come in if accidentally or on purpose you might have access, your phone, your endpoint might have access to both of those contexts. Then it would say 500 at what? Which one do I do? There are reasons why you want to have separate contexts. Full address, 500 at demo is different than 500 at default. Why might you want to have more than one context? Go ahead. Different locations, multi-tenanted. If you have several tenants. Yeah, same thing, multi-tenants. If you are running an asterisk system where you want, like, say, Joe's Crab Shack to have a context, you can tell it's lunch, I'm getting hungry, right? Okay, Joe's Crab Shack, but then you wanted um, Nadine's Knitwear, over here to have a different one, then you could do that. You could have all of their extensions there. Or in some organizations, not even multi-tenanted, there are some numbers that would execute bits of logic that you don't want some people to be dialing, such as if you have um, a, a nice intern on the front desk and they have a girlfriend in Germany. All right, you don't want to give them access to your international context, perhaps? Maybe not, okay. Especially if it's not, if it's a, it's a pay, International calls, you can see that. So you may segregate classes of access that way simply by using contexts. Because contexts, where you put your extensions, are discrete and you cannot get out of them unless you do a couple of things. You could do something sneaky like include another context and then they'd have access. Or you could, in another context, context have a bit of logic that explicitly names that other context and jump into it. But unless you put that logic in it, those buckets are separate and they won't meet. Okay? Which is why you'll be saying, why can't I get this call to go through? Does it have access to the context it needs? A little bit about um, contexts. You want them to be separate. I've said why. They can be dangerous. You could dial things you don't want to. You could have access to things that might create a loop over and over again that you totally did not anticipate simply because you reused the extension numbers or names inside different contexts and you accidentally gave access one to the other. It is good practice when you don't want to use something to comment it out. But here's what can happen if you're careless with your comments. Somebody quick tell me on this side, um, what is very, very bad about them commenting out the context header? Exactly. So now everything, all of these extensions are suddenly part of the green context. All right. If you have to comment out some extensions, you can safely comment out all of the extensions and leave the, co the context header itself just that way, and it won't hurt a thing. The asterisk doesn't care if it's got an empty context. It doesn't care. All right. Or you can comment out all of them. You can even put a block comment on there if you wanted to, all right? Depends upon how long it is and how many comments, all right? There are quick trips, tricks in VI or Vim that will allow you to very quickly comment every single line in visual block mode, okay? You can watch Billy Chia's presentation or I'll show you how to do that after this if you don't know how, okay? It's fun, all right? But see, asterisk doesn't care. You got that context. Well, what can be in, what can be in context? Contexts are containers to hold your extensions. Extensions are bits of dial plan logics. They are not necessarily endpoints. They may be how you get one endpoint to ring another through logic, but they are not a one-to-one -one relationship. Not phones, okay? More like a script. In fact, we call it, it's really an asterisk scripting language, even though it's parsed and it is not um, interpreted, okay? All right, so in your context, you have extensions, and every single extension does an application. It calls an application. And in fact, if you have an extension and it has lots 
of applications, they complete an order synchronously and block the next one from going. And we'll see this in a second. It won't go on until the first one has completed or quit. And then it will drop down to the next one. It will fall through. It drops down. Now, syntax-wise, OK. Alphanumeric names, great. 1,000, yes, you can name something Tom. And in fact, lots of people do, because you can use logic to direct inside the dial plan without ever having to dial a DTMF number. You can use something called a go to, which Justin will be explaining this afternoon, to go to a named context, in this case, Tom. But in this case, showing you some examples of extension, your name, 1000 Tom or 1234, your priority, when do you want that to execute? First, second, third, fourth? Okay. And also your application. In this case, you see one of the most frequently used application, dial, the technology of SIP, and an endpoint called Digium Phone. So your applications take arguments and parameters. We'll tell you how do you find out what they are. If you were here earlier this morning, you saw that when I couldn't remember something, I did core show application record or show application whatever, if I cannot remember the types of arguments or the syntax that that takes. That's your first stop shopping on the CLI for that. Okay. Other types of applications might be dial Q, voicemail. Right. There are, AGI is actually an application, is how you would call an AGI script. No op and verbose. Suppose you want to leave yourself silly messages or useful messages. You can actually put a no op, which does nothing except print some instructions to you on an extension just like this. And so whenever something is dialed, whoops, then it will hit it. So in your context, you have extensions, you have applications, and those applications are executed in a certain order, and that order is called a priority. Okay. One, two, three, four. Yes, it is before the application, because that's important too. It's where you position it when you're writing this. Every priority executes exactly one dial plan application. You can't put multiple applications on one line. You have to give them each a line. Asterisk applications perform actions on or to a channel. That's just what they do. It's the nature of asterisk. If you don't have channels, you don't have nothing. That's why asterisk exists. Data pass in and out, communication. All right. And so a channel, it can set up a channel. Okay. One of them can bridge channels, but an application will usually do something to a channel. Right. And I've already told you that core show applications, that gives you the complete list of applications. And if you core show application, whatever, it will give you everything you need to know to configure that. Well, that and your neighbor whom you're going to call when you can't get it right. Okay. So for multi-line extensions, you jump in your context and you're looking at somebody's dial plan and you can see that an extension is multiple lines long. What you're seeing on the screen here is, is sort of like an a open time capsule from several years of development in asterisk. When asterisk first started out, the syntax for declaring your priority lines was always extend, bang, extend, bang, one, two, three, et cetera. As it evolved, the same designator came about. And essentially, that just means ditto, right? Whatever's above. So this one in the second example, 6,000, 6,000 priority two. But you could leave it off as long as you use the same designator. If you've ever looked in somebody's dial plan, it could be done either way, either way. But down below here is probably my favorite. They're not only using the same designator, they're using an N. So anybody got to guess what N might mean? Next. Exactly. This is important because if I had an extension that had 100 lines in it and I changed one line in it and I were using this old-fashioned designation, what would I have to do? You are correct. I would have to change every single number, which is a pain, which is why this particular one down here, so we see extension 6000, priority 1, playback, hello world, same in. Now, that really does have a number. Asterisk knows the number. You may not know what the number is, but asterisk knows. Okay. In fact, it can tell you. And if you don't know what it is or in which priority they will execute, you can find that out on the CLI also. 
Let's see if I can get a good uh, transition on this. We can, yes. All right. Let's jump back on my CLI. And here we are. Let us look at, if I did dial plan show, then I would see an awful lot of junk. This is my extensions.conf. And I'm going to jump out and I'm going to vim my, oh, look at that. I forgot to reload voicemail. Somebody? Yeah? Mm hmm. Okay. So from the morning session, people will remember that I unloaded my voicemail. And I warned, they warned me this would happen, and I paid no attention. Okay. All right. So in particular, let's look at this context features. There's some stuff up here we're not going to cover yet, but you can talk to me after class or wait for Justin in the afternoon if you want to. I have an extension 1000, and I have same. It's got this thing called dump chan on it, whatever that is. And oh, it's an application, isn't it? You know that. All right. And it does something special. That one actually dumps all my channel information. Extremely useful for troubleshooting. Every bit about including channel ID. Okay. All right. It'll wait 30 seconds, an application that does nothing but wait. That would be nice. I would have somebody at home with a nice, you know, iced tea on, a, they just, that doesn't work that way. Play back a sound file called TT Weasels. Wait again. This is an extension that I set up just for one reason, as a test extension. I got silly with it. The reason I did this was to sustain a channel for you to see it on the CLI, okay, to make it not go away when I dialed it. But which of these priorities is going to be executed? Now, I think that dump chan is priority two, because it's second in line, okay? Wait here is three, four, five, six. I believe that's true, but you could only imply that from my dial plan. However, asterisk knows. In fact, if I do, dial plan show. Did anybody remember the, um, the context that that was in? Features. I just want to narrow that down. I don't have to show everything. OK. That's too much information. How about dial plan show 1,000 at features? Yep, there you go. Then you can see that asterisk prioritizes these for you. One, two, three, four, five, six. More flexibility, and in fact, some things you might do. And here's a tip, and it's not on the slide. But this is why the no-op is so valuable. Some people begin every single extension they have with an application called no-op or verbose instead. It does nothing except it gives you a message when that piece of logic is run. And that way, it's always priority one whatever they do, and it might say something like, this is Josh's extra special extension that calls an AGI script that does this. That might be the text message that's put in, no op, okay? And then every time, that would be priority one, and so if you're looking on the CLI, that message would come up um, at the, well, at verbosity level three. If you do verbose, you can control it so it comes up at level zero. More about that later, okay? You would see that, and not only that, but every single priority underneath it you could just reorder those at will. You would never have to mess with that priority one. Whereas if you did an extension that priority one was dial, dial sep digium phone, ah, oh, if you wanted to put you know, anything in priority one, you're still going to have to rewrite something. So you can begin it with a little statement called no op. Instead, and this is an example of what I would not do. I mean, you can do this fine. Priority one, 6,000. Playback. Okay. Now in this, making your dial plan readable, because there's going to be a bunch of it, a bunch of it. How do you know as a human what this priority does? Very soon after N came the idea of labeling, labeling a priority. So you could use human readable words in order to jump to it. Okay. And in this case, 6,000, priority one, play back the sound file. Okay. Going to here, two, priority two, it drops down, plays back goodbye, drops down to three, but it's a go-to. That application is going to go to priority two. So what's going to happen in this case if I call this extension? I say goodbye, 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 goodbye already. Okay. 
and it's, it's frantic. Okay. However, in this case, it's much the same. This also has the same silliness to it. But this shows you that instead of using a priority, you can actually use a label instead. This just makes it more human readable for you. And this is just a syntactical thing that you may, not, may, not, you may know already, or you may be introduced to it here for the first time. Notice here that if you're going to use that with an N, that has to be squished right up against your label. The comma does not come until after that priority. This is just a syntactical thing that's pretty neat. However, in this case, it doesn't really do anything except make you crazy because it's a silliness. It's to illustrate a point, start of loop. So you name your label something that you can think like, um, Josh's extra special label that is labeling this because it does this. Okay, but don't put any spaces in there. Okay, or I said no white space, right? Okay. Okay, so we've got about a few minutes for questions right now, and I, can sh I could show you what I mean about the no-op statement. So you're thinking up your questions for a couple of minutes while I'm looking at this. And pretty soon we'll have some. All right. Let me just do CD Etsy asterisk. Going to get back to two of the most useful applications. You see here I have some pretty silly craziness here, extend 1,000. Well, priority-wise, in order to make this work right, I am going to have to edit this if I want to put a no-op statement in here. Sorry about that. thought I did. Sorry. And let's just do same equals, don't forget that. And I could put a label in here if I wanted to, sound file. I don't care. If I wanted to make it jump to that, it makes no difference. That's an example of how to do. And notice background actually takes the argument of what the sound file is. 1001, let's do a statement called no op, okay? And the argument it's gonna take is gonna be Josh's extra special. And it can be, in, can be everything inside the no op statement is considered to be in quotes. Just getting, for any of you who are sticklers about white spaces, if you put that argument inside here, it's considered to be in quotes, so if it's a string, it's not going to mess up your dial plan. Josh's extra special application, uh, special extension. Okay, so we're going to save that. And do I look like I've got it right? No, I don't. Look at this. I've forgotten something, didn't I? Mm-hmm. That would have been a badness, wouldn't it? Okay, that looks better. Do you notice the Vim has this lovely syntax highlighting? That's why I, I love syntax highlighting because it clearly told me I'd made a mistake. All right. Okay, so no op. And what happens if we dial 1,000? Okay. Let's bring asterisk up and find out. Beep. Okay. We dial 1,000. Welcome. Welcome. Okay, that was Dump Chan, by the way, if you've never seen that before. And it's waiting right now. So what it did before it did dump chan, which is probably a bad example, was that it should have put my lovely, well, where'd it go? I did not reload my dial plan. Very good. So what you have to do whenever you make a change, do dial plan reload. So it wasn't there before. Hang up. Reloading all of those, reparsing that. And I still don't see it. Okay. I'll tell you what we'll do. Now I'll be quiet. All right. It's telling me that weasels ate my phone system. So we see that no op is very good. And tell you what we're going to do here is comment that out. Josh's extra special extension. That should be right. And if I had made changes to the SIP endpoints, which you're going to learn about after lunch, then I would have to reload SIP.conf.
Okay. Oh, Josh, a special extension. I was probably just going blind at that point. All it does is when, when you execute that extension, if you use no op, is it's going to quote whatever you put there, which is useful to, when you're testing, to liberally sprinkle no op statements throughout your dial plan. It has a sister, which is called verbose. Now, verbose actually is able to display these at different verbosity levels. For instance, no op begins showing at verbosity level three. Okay, that's just designed to do that. But with verbose, if you wanted to clamp down and not have so many uh, lines on your CLI, you would be able to do verbose, and in the brackets you would put zero, comma, and then what you wanted to say. Okay, specify the verbosity level at which it appears. And that's just a troubleshooting tip or tool. But I couldn't let you get out of here and go to lunch without seeing that. Well, I could have. All right, so for a review, furthering that, got it. We've looked at some basic extensions. We've covered this. Right now, before we go to lunch, we've got about five minutes. We've got some questions. Okay. Probably what it will happen is hit the first extension that it finds. So if it begins, and in, yeah, in fact, I know that's what will happen. It'll never get to the second extension, okay? And in fact, you can lab that up and, and try it, you know, on a virtual machine, and you'll see it's exactly what happens, okay? Yes? Priority numbers, if they're not unique, the second one will be ignored. So that makes, if, for instance, if you have two priority ones, it won't even pay attention to the second one, if you labeled it one and one, which is why net, the N designator is pretty good for that, too, okay? Okay. There's not really a way to do a context within a context. That's where context includes comes in. So if you wanted to be able for everything in that context to have access to some logic, then you would use an include statement, like a include this context. Okay, so that might be what you're looking for. But no, a context within a context is not quite. Okay, all right. So if anybody have a couple more questions? Because it's just about time to go hit the pool. Okay. Every single application. Um, somebody built one of those at one time, but it, it outdates, it gets out of date very quickly. Um, and in fact, where that was, was on VoIP info at, at one point in time. Um, is there a current reference that just tells what every application does? I don't think anything is parsed out of the, uh, I can't say that. I think wiki.asterisk.org does have something. So check on wiki.asterisk.org, okay. Right. Okay. Thanks for the dial plan reload. I'm starving and I just went to do. Sorry. You do. Okay. Dave, let's get this.